Come on, y'all. How many hungry for God's word this morning? I want you to open your Bible to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. And the title of my message this morning is Sacrificial Service. Sacrificial Service. One of the things that you see when you look at the Apostle Paul's life is that the Apostle Paul was an individual who clearly, he left it all on the table for God. He stated in the scripture that he knew that he was being poured out as a drink offering. He knew that that was his life was what was about. His life was about being poured out, leaving the earth empty, having given God all that he possibly could, and having given God's people all that he possibly could. He knew that he was a drink offering. Death, ring, death, death was not something that he was afraid of. Death was not something that, that he was concerned about because he understood where he was going after death, but he made it a point when it came to preparing for death to give his life fully over. And this is what he did. He was not afraid because he, he died empty. He said he was being poured out as a drink offering. And in our minds, it's something that we all have to fully embrace, that while we, while we are on this planet, we have to give God our best to pour ourselves out to be a blessing. And that, and it, that requires sacrifice. Serving people, serving God, serving your family, giving of yourself is a part of the Christian lifestyle. It's something that we signed up to do. It doesn't mean that you don't have great times and, and blessings flow and all those things, but, part, but this all works together. The Apostle Paul said that he was being poured out as a drink offering. His mindset was right when it came to being in this world but not being of the world. And knowing that God had called him for a purpose. And every single word, one person in this, per, in this room, just understand that you may not be called to be a pastor. You may not be called to serve in church full time. You may not be called to, but you are called to do something on this planet for God. Amen. Every person. You are not on this planet just to live and then die. You are here because God has purpose for your life. Every single person. And we want to make sure we fulfill our purpose and we push ourselves to being the best that we possibly can be for God. And you want to die having poured out everything you could and, and, and have left it on the table. Because why? Jesus, you called me and you called me with purpose. And I want to give myself fully over to you. And first, I mean, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 24, it says this. The Apostle Paul says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. He says, for the sake of his body, which is his church. He says, of which I became a minister, a servant, according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me, he says, for you. To fulfill the word of God. I love this because he's basically saying God gave me something. And he gave me something so that I can give it to you. So I didn't just get something just for me. I received this stewardship and it wasn't because of my qualifications, how good I am, how good I look, how many you know, degrees I have and all these other things. I received the stewardship but I received it for somebody else. That my life isn't just about me, it's about something that God imparted to me, share with me, so that I could share it with somebody else. What well, God was thinking about me, but he wasn't just thinking about me, he was thinking about you. This is what he's communicating. He says, of which I became a minister, a servant of God, according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. He says in verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Now watch this, y'all. He says, which is Christ in you, the hope 
of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This message that he received, this message that we all should receive, is a message that involves us understanding that God is trying to transform you and I into his image from glory to glory. That Christ in us is the hope of glory. And for all of us, we have to see this. God's work on you is the work of forging Christ's nature and character in your life. Is making you more and more like him. When I got called into ministry, when I got called into ministry, the Spirit of God spoke to me, and it was very clear what the Lord was saying. He said to me, I want you to minister with the, the gifts and the anointing that I place in your life to see the fullness of the manifestation of my life in the believers. To preach, to minister with the gifts that I, to see the fullness of the manifestation of my life in the believers. And that for me has never left me. Over 20 years later, has never left me. That my assignment in the, on the planet is to use the gifts and the anointing that God has placed upon my life to see the fullness of the manifestation of the life of Christ in the believers. That's, that's, if you ask me, that is, that is my mission in life. And that is what God has sent me here to do. To see the fullness of the manifestation of the life of Christ within the believers. Not just to have a big church. Not to be impressive. Not to try to, you know, keep up with everybody, what every other church is doing. Not to try to get on the line and do this and do this. It's just, just to preach and to minister with the gifts and the anointing that God has given me to see the fullness of the manifestation of the life of Christ within the believer. That's my job. And, and, it, and that becomes, it becomes, it begins to consume you. It becomes what you are. The Apostle Paul, he embraced this. He said, Christ in you. Christianity isn't just about getting to heaven. It's about getting heaven in you. It's about getting Christ in you. And seeing Christ fully formed and manifest, manifested in your life. That you become more and more like him on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, you, me and you, you and I cannot make that happen. But Christ, through his spirit, he works in and through us to see this accomplished in people's life. The problem is, is the church, we have gathered people, but people aren't growing up. But the goal is for us to grow up and to become more and more like him on a day-to-day -day basis. Not to be like my favorite preacher. But to, be, to get people to understand that there is a star on these pages. And God our Father wants everyone to look like the, the bright morning star. That we are to be transformed into his image from glory to glory. And for all of us, it becomes a process that can be tough in terms of someone receiving this ministry, but also helping people in ministry. It is what it's about. And sometimes it can be tough, but it's a sacrificial service because God has called us to partner with him to help people to become more like him. Can I have an amen? amen. He says here, he says in verse 27, he says to them God will. And I want you to write this down. Number one, he says, him we preach. Him we preach. And for us, anybody that is here in the church and you desire to help people grow to mature and all those other things, any minister here, pastors here, anyone that is ministering here, we have to understand that this is about him being preached. And this is why I love, I love people, and you guys know I fight as a pastor to keep stuff out of this church that could get us away from this point. I fight it. Some people don't like it. Some people leave the church. Well, you don't talk about politics. and No, I don't because that's not what God told me to do. <laughs> if you don't like it, there's other churches around here. There's one right up the street. You can go. But we're not going to be talking about 
we're going to be talking about Jesus up in here. Can I have an amen? He said, him we preach. That that's the call that, that we preach about him because the people are God's design for people to become like him. Now, praise the Lord, we can have our discussions about other things back home, but when it comes to this pulpit, when it comes to pulpit ministry, we want to focus on things that have to do with Jesus Christ and about people becoming more like him because him we preach. The Apostle Paul understood this. He embraced this. It became a part of his mission that him we preach. We, we get so into denominations, we get so into affiliations, we get so into, you know, uh, the politics, we get so into the gifts of the Spirit and everything else. And, and we understand all those things have their place in our value. But there has to be a position of priority when it comes to preaching the gospel that people learn to focus their eyes on the only one that can change their life. The only one that died on the cross. There was nobody else there with him when he died on that cross and went to the grave. It was him that God was looking for, our Father. And we know that there was, there was two people by his side, but the point I'm trying to make is, is this. The focus is him. He's the only one that had redemption in his hands. He's the only one that had restoration in his hands. He is the only one that had justification in his hands. He was the only one that could ascend with his blood to the right hand of the Father and that could appease the wrath of God on our behalf. He is the only high priest that has been qualified to stand in the throne room of God and re represent humanity as the God-man. Don't get me start preaching. Don't let, don't let me start preaching in here. He's our only one. And so I appreciate people, and I thank God for people. But in this church, I want to continue to remind us that it's him we preach, that he's the one that's glorified. He's the one that has this light on him. He's the one that's the star of the show. He's the one. It's not the smoke and the mirrors and all the other stuff that sometimes we try to make important in our churches. We have to get back to the simplicity of devotion to Christ. It's not the deacon board. It's not the elder board. It's not the pastor. It's not this. And we thank God for everyone's contribution. But the apostle Paul said, him we preach. Him we preach. And this is what we want. We want to we get back to this point and this place within Christianity where there's a focus on Jesus. And my job as your pastor, I'm not called to be everybody's buddy. You don't want me to be your buddy. You don't want me to be. You want a pastor that's going to lead you to Jesus and tell you about Jesus and, 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 and stay focused on Jesus. You don't want a buddy. And that, can I have an amen? You don't want, you don't want me to be your buddy. You want me to be your pastor. You want the elders to be your pastors. You want people that are going to, they're going to stand on the side of Jesus. And we're cool. We love everybody. I love everybody. And I friends here, but there's a line that you don't cross because, hey, man, I, I don't need another buddy in my life. I need somebody to give me the word of God. I want somebody to preach to me and tell me what Jesus said. I don't want any partiality in my Can I have an amen? I don't want any partiality. I don't want somebody so wrapped up in me emotionally that they won't speak the truth to me in love. Can I have an amen, y'all? He said, him we preach. Now watch this. He says, him we preach. He says, warning every man. He says, him we preach. So we want, we want him to be preached, but then there's a warning aspect of the gospel that we have to fully embrace. This word here in the Greek, it means to admonish. This word warning, it means to counsel. It means to exhort. It means to comfort. But, and it also means to correct. And so when it comes to the Apostle Paul, he understood as he's church, talking to the church at Colossae, he's t letting them know that there's, we got to preach him, but then he says we also have to warn. There's a warning aspect of ministry that has to be reintroduced to the church. An admonishing, a correcting, a counseling, a comforting that has to be fully embraced and that's part of Christianity 
He says, warning every man. Sometimes, I love it when God sends me warnings. Because it is an extension of his grace and mercy in my life. When somebody warns, when God uses someone to warn or when God releases warning, it is a, listen saints, it is a wonderful thing that God would take time to send someone or even just talk to you through his word to say, hey, I'm warning you about this. I'm just warning you about this. That's, it's just God's love and grace towards you when he does that. I love it. It's don't go down that road. Don't go down that road. And what happens to us is sometimes we think warning means God hates us. Or the person that's warning us hates us. When it's not, it's, it's an extension of God's grace. And I can remember times in my life where as, as a man of God, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. And God sent me a warning and I didn't listen. And I told you all that story about me and Kenyon up in the mountain. When I got hit in the eye. I didn't blame the devil. I told Kenny, I said, this is God. He told me not to come up here. <laughs> Elder Kenny, you remember that? We was, I was up there visualizing. I had it all. Man, I'm going to have a 200 acres. Oh, the Lord, I'm looking up. I'm, yes, this is the will of God. Oh, I feel the presence of God. It wasn't the presence of God. It was the wind blowing. <laughs> yes, it must be God. It must be pow. I said, Kenya, we got to go. He said, you don't want to see this other part? I said, no, no, no. I can't see. My eye is jacked up. My eyes start swelling. <laughs> Remember that kid? My eyes start swelling. We got to go to the gas station. I need an ice pack. <laughs> and God had warned me, don't you do that. And what happens is we don't realize that that is an extension of God's grace in our lives. He says, he says, him we preach. He says, warning, embrace warning in the church. Embrace this aspect of admonishment and counsel and exhortation and comfort and correction because what it's doing is it's going to help us to become more like him. He says, him we preach, warning every man. He says, and teaching every man in all wisdom. Teaching. We need to focus on Christ. We have to fully embrace the warning aspect of ministry because it's going to it's going to make us. And then we have to embrace teaching. In our church, we love, there's a, a didactic aspect to ministry that we also have to fully embrace. We don't know everything. We need to be taught when it comes to spiritual things. God goes to great lengths to raise up people and to train people and to take people through the process of breaking, to make them great servants in terms of giving us the word of the Lord and teachings that we need and the right doctrine so that we're feasting on the right things so that we can properly go, grow and mature. And all those things are, are God's extension of mercy and grace to us once again because he raises up people to teach us. We have to learn how to be great learners and students and how to work the fundamentals the fundamental principles of the doctrines of Christ so that it becomes fixed in us and there's a great foundation to which we now build our lives upon. That also means that sometimes we have to take things that we have learned in times past and if they do not line up doctrinally, we have to be willing to say, I believe something that was wrong. Now I'm going to believe that which is right because through scripture it's been proven to be right. I want to embrace the teachings. It's hard for people to accept sometimes that they were wrong or they believe something that was wrong. But it takes humility to say, yeah, I did. I did believe that. I was wrong. But then God, because of his grace and mercy, he sent me the right message that now I'm willing to fully embrace, and now I want that to be a part of my foundation. Well, sometimes we have to tear stuff up so that God can relay the foundation that is the right foundation so that we can build. 
When it comes to church doctrines, we have to always be examining what we're, because God is clearly, you know, giving us revelation progressively over time. Well, let's take a look at this scripturally to make sure that we're on point with what God is saying. There's nothing wrong with that. But we can't fake like we know something when we do not know it. We have to embrace teaching and be great students. Learn how to listen with the intent of obeying. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Well, that, what that means is hear with the intent of obedience. So I hear, I want to apply what I'm hearing to my life. I want to be a great teacher. I want to be a great student. I want to be very studious. Jesus sat down before the rabbis, and he sat down, and he sat there. The Bible says he listened, and he asked questions. He's growing. He's developing. What does he do? He sits down, and he's listening to them, and he's asking them questions. And then they'd asked him questions, and the scripture said they were, they were astonished at his responses and how he would respond. But he goes through this growth process. All of us need that. Most of us, I wasn't raised in the church. And I know people that were raised in the church, but they still didn't know nothing about, but just go to church. But I wasn't, I wasn't raised in the church. When I came and I started reading my Bible, this was so foreign to me. And, and, and the thing that I loved at that time that God just had just placed in my heart, well, you have to become a student. So I started looking at it like I was a student and I was learning the fundamental principles of Christ so that I can continue to grow. And all of us, we have to embrace that. Stop trying to make it seem like you know when you don't. And if, and if you do, continue to grow. There's never a time in your life, oh, I got to say it. Pastor James Davis, I can still remember things that he said over 20 years ago. He said to us, he says, sons, the minute you stop growing, that's when death sets in. Amen. I said, whoa. I said, the minute I stop growing, that's when death sets in. Because the minute you think you got this all figured out, and you think no one can tell you nothing, and stop thinking that you... That you're wise because you're older. <laughs> Look at somebody and say, wow. <laughs> hey, old don't mean wise. <laughs> Can I have an amen? Because I know some old fools. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have an amen? And the minute you and I stop growing, that's when death sets in. Death starts to kick in. We want to be people that are constantly growing and maturing and studying and praying and reading and studying and praying, listening, asking questions, listening, asking questions, because it's going to help us to grow. He says, teaching every man in all wisdom. He says, teaching every man in all wisdom. We have to see this church isn't a place where we just come and dance and sing and, and feel good. I want to dance and sing. That's part of it. But now I want to sit down. I want to take out my notepad and I want to take notes and I want to learn and grow. And I want to study and, and, and go home and meditate on this stuff and say, okay, God, what he just preached, I want to apply that to my life. I don't want to just be in my head. I got to get this in my heart so I start living it out. So now it becomes a part of me so I become more like you, Jesus. He says, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. Now watch this, that we may present every And this was his heart, to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, that people become more like Jesus. And this point here is important. We, we want to understand that as Christians, we want to be like Christ. As Christians, I want to be like Christ. Now, this means that I don't define what Christ looks like. I let the scriptures define what Christ looks like. Because the Bible talks about another Jesus. 
And people are painting a picture of Jesus that is not the Jesus that has been revealed through the scriptures. And that's part of the problem. He said false Christ will come. Many Christ will come. People will say Christ is here, Christ is there. He talks about this. The scripture talks about this. We want to allow the scripture to clearly define what Jesus looks like. We don't want to imagine a Jesus as our co-pilot. We, 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 imagine, we imagine Jesus as, as something that we want him to be instead of just letting the scriptures reveal him. God, reveal yourself through the pages to define who you are. Jesus is not just a lamb. The Bible calls him a lion. Jesus is not just loving. He is also just and the God of justice. There, Jesus is not just someone that will forgive sins. He just doesn't just forgive sins. He will also discipline for sin. So yeah, there's a balance. Somebody say balance. The scripture begins to paint a picture of him that is a balanced picture. We have to fully embrace that and say, okay, God, this is who you reveal yourself as. I want to embrace that. And then I want you to you to uh, allow me to be transformed into your image and likeness from glory to glory, but I got to fully re receive who you are and let the word of God define who you are. I cannot, the mistake that the Israelites made is that when they were coming out of Egyptian captivity, Moses took them to a place. He goes to the high up in the mountain with God. He's there. He's there for longer than the people wanted. When Moses did not come down, they asked Aaron to make them an image that would be their God. So Moses is up there, and Aaron, what does he do? What does the preacher do? What did the person that God had called do? He, he, he goes in, and he gives in to the the pleas of the people, and he goes and he fashions and makes something that the people desire. Mm, mm, mm. Instead, of, instead of letting God be God and being patient and letting him reveal himself, he goes and he makes a golden calf and says, here it is, worship that. And this is what happens in pulpits all over the world. Instead of Waiting for the true and living God to, to reveal himself and do what he, and he's already revealed himself, but he's not giving the people what they want. So people stand up and they start painting a picture of Jesus that's not the real Jesus. They make an image that the people are desiring. God never gets mad at you. Don't you know he just loves you and he never gets mad. He never gets angry. And that he's all just love. It's just love conquers all. And he never gets mad. And I'm sitting there and I'm reading my Bible. And I'm listening to what the person said. And I'm reading my Bible and I'm listening to what the person said. My Bible. I said, man, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus just get a... Make scourge. Turn over tables. Kick people out of their own service. And start whipping people out of the church? I mean, didn't he just do that? Now, who, what Jesus are you talking about? Can I have an amen, y'all? And I don't know about you, just in my personal relationship with God, um, I don't know who they're talking about because God has given me some spankings. Has anybody in the room got a spanking and you knew it was from the Lord? So I don't know what you're talking about. But don't paint a picture of God as just being this or that. The God that I serve isn't always mad at me either. I don't walk into church and feel like I'm going to drop dead. He's, God, he's not always mad. God is mad at me. Why? Because I didn't take out the trash. Come on, man. God is not always mad at you over everything. 
He's not always mad. And what happens is we, we paint these pictures in our minds and we make an image. And then we think that that's it. Let God define to you who he is through the word of God and then understand that there's a balance associated with that. And for us as saints of God, we have to make sure that we're constantly leading people to the scripture because Jesus alone can reveal himself. He has to reveal himself. Can I have an amen? amen. He says that we might become mature, that we might grow up, that we might go to the next level on who we are as saints of God, understanding that that is the heart of the ministry, that, that we might be perfect or mature in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, and this is what I wanted to really get to. He says, to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. He says, to this end, I also labor. This word labor in the Greek, it means to be worn out. It means to be weary. It means to be tired. It means to give of yourself. He says, to this end, because I want to see people transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. I want to see people understand that it's him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we might present every man perfect or complete in Christ. He says, to this end, he says, I labor. It's work. Your life is work. Now, there's something that's going to kick in for you here in this verse that is a beautiful thing. But understand, God has not designed us to be people that just go around kicking our feet up. If you are a Christian, God wants you to serve. And there's a sacrificial serving that's involved in being a servant of Christ. That there is work. There's work to be done. There's labor. The, the, the harvest is ready. He said, but who are few? The labor. The laborers are few. He said, people, they don't want to labor. They don't want to help somebody else. They don't want to give on themselves. They just want to be catered to. They don't want to. Every person in this church should be serving in some capacity. Every person. And if you're not serving here, you are purposeful on making sure that you outside it in the marketplace, you are serving in some capacity. Because God does not want us just to be inlets. He wants us to be outlets. And that means that sometimes we are going to be tired. Then go take a rest. And then get back up and get back in the game. There's going to be times when you don't feel like it. But you do it because this is a part of your passion and your heart from God and your service to God. He says labor. That means that sometimes we're going to feel worn out. Sometimes we're going to feel weary. Sometimes we're going to feel like, like, man, I don't know if I can go another step. This was Apostle Paul's heart and it's what he did. And it's for all of us, especially you that are, that are, that are ministers and deacons and elders and things of that nature in the church, it should just be your heart to serve because that's what it's all. Your title means nothing if you're not functioning. People think, people, I want to be a preacher. I want to be a pastor. I want to do this. Do you know that this stuff will kill you, man? Can I have an amen? I know some of y'all like, man, it, this is not easy. This is not easy. This is, it's not easy. People think it's easy. It's not. And then some people, they thought it was easy, and then they got a chance to come up here and speak, and then you find out, uh, 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 it's not easy standing before all these people and talking. And people are like, you better know what you're talking about, too. Can I have an amen? amen? I didn't come to church to hear no gibberish. You better give me some word. <laughs> it's not easy. Serving in the church is not easy. So I, I want people to understand that's not, it's not. It's labor. And it's labor intensive. Stuff gets heavy. It gets deep. 
We're dealing with life. We're dealing with demons that are trying to kill us. And, this, and the devil, we, I can't even get to that part yet because we're dealing with this part. But then the demonic aspect of it, when the devil is trying to take you out and convince you that you'll never have success. And it'll never be, and you'll never, and the devil starts attacking your mind in ministry. People say, it's amazing to me. People say, Pastor, I'm having problems. What's the problem? I'm hearing voices. I say, listen, I hear voices all the time. Rebuke the devil and tell the devil to shut up and cast him out of your mind and out of your heart and rebuke him in the name of Jesus and pick yourself up and bind him and keep on rolling with Jesus Christ. Can I have an amen? I fight demons on a day-to-day -day basis, and I say, devil, you're not going to win. You lose in the name of Jesus because I'm covered in the blood. I'm washed in the blood. I got the mind of Christ, and I am free indeed. Can I have an amen, y'all? You better rebuke the devil and keep it moving. These demons are always talking to people. Tell them to shut up. I know exactly who they are. I'm not confused when I hear them voices. I know, I know exactly who you are. I bind you in Jesus' name. Amen. Look what he says. To this end I labor. It's work, y'all. And then he says this. This is good. Striving. Striving. He says labor. It's a sacrificial service. He says labor. And then he says striving. This word here in the Greek, it means to contend for victory in the public games. Strive to contend for victory in the public games. It means to fight. Somebody say fight. fight. It means to wrestle. It is the task of faith and persevering amid temptation and opposition. So when he's standing here, he realizes that he's got a call from God to, to preach him, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that he might present every man perfect in Christ. And then he goes on and he says, to this end, I also labor. He says, striving. That Wait a minute, this is a fight. This is a public spectacle. On your job, you are on public display. In church, public dis display. Ministry, public display. That your life is in public display and you are fighting for victory. You're not just fighting for yourself. You're fighting also for other people. That they might receive victory in their life. That you help them to arrive at a place where they understand that they need Jesus in their life. And realizing that it is the task of faith and persevering amid temptation and opposition. Every day the devil's going to tempt you, he's going to try you, but you persevere through faith. And this isn't something that is secret because ultimately it may be secret for a while, but all things will be disclosed. Understanding that on a day-to-day -day basis, this is what we do. He said striving. So I'm in a fight. And I'm going to fight for not just my life, but for the life of people. I serve not just for my life, but for the life of people. Saints, understand that we all have to embrace this. You're fighting for your kids. You're fighting for family members. You're fighting for your church members. You're fighting for people on your job. You're fighting for people that need to see hope in your life by the decisions that you make. And as a result of that, there's a striving and there's a, there's a, there's a, understand that there's too much passivity that we've had in Christianity. It's too much passivity, too much lackness. You know, when people just laid back and, and, and slackness and, and just, well, you know, it's, it's okay. If I don't bother the devil, he won't bother me. It's all good, you know. I don't want to cause any problems. Sometimes you have to fight before you have peace. Can I have an amen, y'all? Woo, I like that. Sometimes there needs to be a big fight before you can get to peace. 
And, and it's like that, but lot, some people are so, with their spiritual life, are so passive that they don't realize that you're, you, you and I have to strive. We have to strive. That means that there's a war going on, and I'm going to win this wrestling match. I'm going to win this fight. And that I am not going to allow myself to be overtaken by the enemy's uh, opposition, his corruption. I'm going to fight back. Well, what happens for a lot of people, they just quit. They're, quitting. They're used to quitting. There's no internal fortitude. Now, the thing that's amazing to me is God tells us that we're in a big fight. That we're in this big fight and, and we have to strive and we labor. But listen to what the Apostle Paul said, and this is so powerful. He says, to this end I also labor striving, now watch, according to his working which works in me mightily. So the beautiful thing about this fight is that I have an energy, that Greek word there, energeo, his working in me mightily. It means that God... He supplies the energy that I need to win in the battle. Energia, energia, and energeo. These words together are working together to, these words are working together to paint a picture of there's an energy that is surged within my being that helps me to labor when I don't feel like laboring. Helps me to labor when I feel like I'm going to die. It helps me to labor when I feel like I can't take another step. But there's an energy that hits me. Amen. That when it's, I'm striving in the public games for victory and wrestling with the enemy to make sure that he doesn't take me over, that there's an energy that starts to hit my, whoo, I'm feeling that energy. There's an energy that starts to hit me that helps me to go on when I feel like I can't go on anymore. This is the picture that he's painting, that there's something that the Holy Spirit, imp he empowers you to win the fight. So I can't say that I won the fight in my own strength because it, it took more than my own strength. But God says that I will give you strength that comes from me. There's an energy that comes, this working which works in me mightily. Now I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He gives me the power to do it. How do I tap into this power? I tap into this power through prayer. Yeah. Write it down, y'all. How do I tap into this energy? I do it through prayer. The Holy Spirit supplies me the energy that I need. It works in me mightily. But I have to learn how to pray. I consecrate myself. Pray to God. And allow God to infuse me with more energy to do the job that he's called me to do. You have a limitless supply of power that God has in store for you. Whatever amount of power that you need to get your assignment done on the earth, God has it. Amen. Pastor, I can't raise these kids my, by myself. Yeah, you can. He done walked out. Let him leave. You can do it. You can do it by the grace of God. She left. You got it. You got everything you need. The Holy Spirit is going to give you the power that you need to get it, get it done. Pastor, I just, I lost my job. I don't know what you're going to do. Tap into the source. He's going to see you through this. You're going to make it. You're going to survive. You're not going out like this. God's got your back. Can I have an amen? Just stay connected to the vine. There's a supply there for you. I'm working on this job. They're working me overtime. Well, they're working you overtime, but keep collecting them checks. <laughs> and keep it moving. Ask God to give you some more. <laughs> you better ask God to give you some more, <laughs> some more strength and collect them checks. Can I have an amen, y'all? <laughs> keep collecting them checks. Stay connected to the vine. You're going to be all right. <laughs> Can I have an amen, y'all? You better, and then God supplies the power. He supplies the power. He supplies the power. He said that works in me mightily. It works in me mightily. God gives us what we need so that we can accomplish the task, but we have to pray. Pray and ask God. Number two, you have to remain consecrated. 
Your consecration is a, is a weapon against the devil. If you start to feel like you're in this battle and you're striving, but then you start to give up your consecration, then you lose your power. Understand that when Samson fell by the hands of Delilah, it was not, his, his hair wasn't his source of strength. It was his consecration as a Nazarite. And the hair was just a sign. He lost his power when he refused to remain consecrated before God. And so he had lost before he had lost because he started going down the wrong road. And what happens, a lot of people say, I'm feeling like I'm getting worn out. But are you remaining consecrated? Consecration is a power position. Remain a Nazarite. Stay away from the stuff that, that, that God doesn't want in your life, and you're going to stay in a position of strength. And now you're not going to be doing things in your own power. Now you're connected to the source. And he strengthens you. So what happens is people, they don't see consecration as a weapon. I keep myself separate from the world. I don't get involved in stuff. I don't open myself up to unclean spirits. And then now power just keeps coming to me, coming to me, coming to me. But when you, when you, when you and I, if we start sinning and going down a road of destruction, then now we start to lose our power. And then things begin to get hard and striving. Now you're striving in your own power. And then we look up and say, what happened? I'm, I'm wore out. I can't go any further. And then it never dawns on us, well, maybe you need to repent. I feel heavy. When I go in to pray, God's not speaking. Yeah, because you need to repent. I'm having problems over here. I'm having problems there. Well, have you, I mean, hey, have you asked God or have you just considered maybe you need to repent? Oh, no, I don't need to repent. I'm perfect. I don't have any problems in my life. I, I, I gave $10 to God. He knows I'm good. <laughs> I gave God 10 but I gave Starbucks 30 <laughs> He knows I did my part. <laughs> I'm hitting everybody up in here. <laughs> I don't have any problem. No, maybe you need to repent. Maybe that's the reason why you're tired all the time, because you wore it out. You, you, the devil was wearing you out <laughs> sinning. <laughs> consecration is a powerful thing, y'all. Don't you let the devil rob you of your consecration, because that's a power position for you. Studying your word. We want more power, we, and we want more energy coming to us we have to start to get into the scripture and the scripture begins to wash us from the impurities that we face every single day. But then not only you get washed, but you get revived through the scripture. Amen. Can I have an amen? The word starts to get in you and wash you and then you start to feel fresh. You know how you feel when you get out the shower. Well, that's what happens. We start to feel fresh and invigorated once we get in here. And the next, you know, whoa, I got a little pep in my step. What happened? Man, I was studying the book of John, chapter 1. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was the same. And oh, my goodness, I feel fresh. The Word is in me. You start to feel fresh and revived by getting in the Scripture. Your fellowship. What kind of fellowship do you have? That's how we get energized and empowered it's through fellowshipping who do you who do you run with because running with the right people will help to strengthen you and they'll you can start to now watch this y'all you sh you can start to siphon off some power from them and they don't even know it can I have an amen? You start getting around people and have good, healthy fellowship, and the next thing you know, they start getting you fired up. Then you start feeling, you start getting, there's a synergistic effect that takes place when you start to get around people that are going in the same direction with you as you from a Christianity standpoint. People will start to inspire you. Iron sharpens what? You start to sharpen each other. 
Like, man, I'm old. Yes, you sharpen me now. I, I'll wait till I cut the devil with this. <laughs> mm. I talk to people all the time, and, I'm, and, I, and I love having conversation. We start talking about the word. We start getting into it, and then they just start giving me some Ginsu knives. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to use that next time the devil. Oh, oh, yeah, that's some good stuff. And what happens is you start to sharpen one another. And there's energy that comes to your soul when you start getting fed by having the right kind of fellowship. But if, if, if we're constantly just fellowshipping with people who are not going in the right direction, that causes you to be dull, dull instead of sharp. It starts to weaken you. We got to make sure that we take time to get around people that we know love God and that iron can sharpen iron and help to get you stronger. Man who isolates himself seeks his own way. He rages against all wise counsel. When we start, there's no way you can grow if you're constantly isolating yourself. You cannot. You will not grow. If, you isolate, if you're isolating yourself all the time and nobody understands, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> nobody knows what I'm going through. Listen, you'd be surprised what people in this room have been through. You are not alone in striving against the devil and striving in life and going through life. People, it just, just open your mouth and let a person, you'll find people have, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm not trying to minimize our pains, but understand you're not the only one going through. Other people are going through also. And sometimes you getting out and letting the person know I'm just struggling with this right now. You'll hear a person say, I, I was too. This is how I got through or I am right now. And let's pray. Let's believe God to break us through this thing because this stuff is heavy and it's not easy to go through life. Can I have an amen, y'all? <laughs> One of the dangers of the church is you sit here and, you, and people just suffer alone. Don't suffer alone. When you can pick up the phone, call somebody and say, hey, let's talk. I want to, or if they don't want to talk, call somebody else. Can I have an amen? amen. Let me share this with y'all. When I first got saved, me and my wife, we didn't know what we was doing. I was the chief heathen. <laughs> All right? And my wife, she was a heathen too, but she wasn't as bad as me. <laughs> All right? I'm just, <laughs> she wasn't as bad as me. So I'll give you some love, honey. <laughs> I was doing. We got married, and I'm, I'm like, you know, I had never seen any successful marriages in my house. But I had some good people that I had fellowship with that were great, great people. And when, when we had issues or we had problems or we had things that were going on or stuff was happening, we didn't like sit back and I would get on the phone and I would call, hey, Jerome, what you think about this? My wife is tripping, dog. <laughs> what is going on with her, man? Man, y'all told me that I need to do right and get married, but I don't know, man. <laughs> he said, I loved it because he wouldn't, he would just straight up tell me the truth. I said, man, you a heathen, man. No, I'm just playing, I'm just playing. He didn't say that. He, he said, man, you got to treat your right... Open the Bible. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. What did the Bible say about how you're supposed to treat your wife? Treat your wife like that, like the Scripture says. What, 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 what about this, though? What does Scripture say? Let's go to the Bible. Let's see what the Bible says about that. Man, she said this. What does Scripture say? What does the Scripture say? And it, it was amazing how... how the fellowship and the counsel that I received, I can, you can, now listen to me say, you can't, there's not a, enough money in the world to pay for that. Amen. The treasures of truth. Amen. The treasures of truth that, that come in and then you look at your life and you say, man, by embracing the truth, look what is done. My wife and I, we have a wonderful marriage. Amen. You, know, you, 
come to my house, it's peaceful. And when the devil does try to do something, I rebuke him and cast him out of my house. We don't tolerate any mess. We're aggressive for peace. Can I have an amen? amen. You got to be aggressive about it. We're not having no mess up in here because I deal with devils all day out there. I'm not going to come home and be dealing with none. The devil is a lie. I, I got to have a sanctuary. Can I have an amen, y'all? But that happens. But that happens because I got people or fellowship. Get people around you that are going to help to encourage you to go back. What does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? Now, let me say this, and I'm going to move on from this point. And sometimes that may mean it's not always, I mean, I love family members. I love my family members. Honey, we love our family members, don't we? But I'll just say, they are not always the people that I call. Okay? And, and you want to have people around you that even if they are family members that have, you want somebody that is not biased. That loves you enough just to tell you the truth. And even if they're your mom, your dad, your cousin, your uncle, uh, you know, sweet pea, all of them. Just tell them, listen, man, I got I to gotta hear from God on this. I know you love me so much. I don't want your, if you're going to tell me, tell me. But don't, don't try to sugarcoat it. You need someone that's not biased. And that's not only just family members in the church. Just tell me the truth. That's all I want to know. And then what happens is, watch this. You start to get infused with an energy. That keeps you going. Ministry, life in general, is not easy. It takes a supply that we don't have outside of ourselves to do it correctly. Amen. There's only one being in the universe that has the ability to infuse life to us and to cause us to be great success, successes on this planet according to his definition of success. And that is the only God most high. We have to learn how to access this energy that is necessary because we're going to be laboring and we're going to be striving because we want to see people's lives change. And sometimes you and I are going to feel wore out. We're going to feel tired. We feel like we can't do it anymore. But if we're praying, if we're studying our word, if we're getting good fellowship, if we're making sure that we stay consecrated, what happens is we position ourselves to access this inner jail that comes from God. And then people look up and they say, how do you do it? And you can tell them that because I've tapped into a supply that is not of myself. This is the reason why I got all these sales on the job, because God isn't supplied the power. This is the reason why I can take care of my family, because of God supplies the power. This is how I work hard on my job and get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and get on the freeway in the midst of all this traffic, but I keep on doing it day after day after day after day, because there's a power that comes to me. Ooh, I can just feel this. There's a power that comes to me that comes from the throne of God. You may not understand it, but God supplies it. And so there's a sacrifice when it comes to serving. Don't try to serve in your own power, saints. Don't try to give of yourself in your own strength. Don't try to be something that you cannot be without God giving you the power to be it. And if you ever feel weary or tired or you feel like you cannot go on, then be honest with yourself and say, God, I need more power that comes from you. I need more fellowship. I need more of the word. I need more prayer. I need more access to who you are so that I can continue to go on. A lot of people just quit. They just give up because their whole life they just quit. In this church, I want our church to be a place where people come and they they get empowered, they feel empowered, and they stay empowered. Because they're working the fundamentals that God has established through his word. 
And then when they do that, they never forget that it's him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we might present every man perfect in Christ. I love people's giftedness, but do I see Jesus? I love people's talents, but do I see Jesus? I love people, people's generosity, but do I see Jesus? I love the way people are blessing the other, but do we see Jesus? Because at the end of the day, what God our Father, Father is looking for is Jesus in everybody. Amen. Can I have an amen, y'all? Can I have an amen, y'all? Come on, everybody stand to your feet. I want to, in a minute here, I want to open this altar because quitting is a heart condition. Quitting is a heart condition. It's something that is a condition of the heart. And I think for all of us here, we have to stop and ask ourselves, where am I? As it pertains to labor and striving. Am I too passive? If I do, I just quit and give up when I know God is telling me to continue to press on. People quit. And they and they and they look back and they say, why did I quit? It was this, it was that. Say it's, it's just your heart. You gotta make up in your heart and in your mind that. The life that I have right now is not so hard that God can't strengthen me to continue on. Now, I may want to change things, and I need to change things in my life. But some of you, you might be in this room thinking about quitting your job. God never told you to quit your job. You say, well, it's hard. And God says, okay. Let me give you some more power. You can do this. Some of you in this room, you're thinking about quitting this or quitting that, and God is saying, I never told you to quit. You just let the devil run you away from the blessing that I was trying to give you. The one that you prayed for me to give you. But now it gets hard, or now you're bored, or now you're this, and I just want to quit. But it's not the heart of God. God will tell you to move on if he tells you to move on. But some of us, we've let the pressure so get to us that that's what is motivating and moving us is that it's not God saying, okay, I'm shutting this door. It's us saying, I'm tired of this. He said he labored, striving according to his working that worked in him mightily. This man poured himself totally out. He didn't have anything else to give. So I'm done. I'm, I gave it all. There's a lot of people, you have more to give. You say, well, I'm trying to raise these kids all by myself. You can do it. You can do it. Well, pastor, I'm raising sons. And they need a man in their life. They may need a man, but they need you. And if you need a brother in the church to come alongside you and, and minister to, your, to them boys and to help them to become men because their dad isn't in their life, well then, hey, call the church. But don't quit. Don't give up. Well, Pastor, I'm, I, I, I just, you know, and we just throw in the towel. And I'm saying, Lord, there's a power that you give that we need. This morning, I want to challenge us as a church again. We don't want to be a lazy, throw-your-feet-up church that just quits, and I'm just looking for leisure. Life isn't about leisure. If you don't work, you don't eat. Can I have an amen, y'all? You don't work, you don't eat. Stop looking for it. And then we have some people in the church, they will tell you, some people have got to a, we were just talking about this the other day. Some people have got to a time where, where, where they work themselves into a position of retirement. But then when you get around them, you see that they're in everybody else's business now. Because 
what is retirement? You may have retired from that job, but you haven't retired from the work of the Lord. Can I have an amen? Just because you retired from the job doesn't mean that God is done with you. God is not done with you. People look up and they say, well, I, now, now they're bored. What do I do with my life? And my, what I say is, get back to work. Get back to work. Get back to work. What is it that God's calling you to do? Maybe he wants you to preach and to teach and to minister to somebody, counsel to somebody, lay hands on somebody, cast the devil out of somebody, heal the sick. Maybe he wants you to go over here to this country and minister over there. Maybe he's not done with you next yet. So the next 30 years of your life, you're just not going to do nothing. He says, striving according to his working. I may not be working on that job, but I'm working for I'm working in the army of the Lord. I am working for Jesus. Can I have an amen? And for all of us here, we got to get out of this quitting mentality. Shut it down mentality. I'm done mentality. And get to this place where I'm not finished yet. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the energy can I have an amen, y'all? Can we give God some praise for that this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you're in this room this morning, if you're in this room, I want you to respond to this altar call to say, God, I lift up my hands and I'm asking you to give me more energy. If I need to consecrate myself, or I need to do this. Show me now in that moment. Come on down to the altar, y'all. Show me now in this moment because it's not leisure time for me. It's time for me to get to work. God has called me to the work of the Lord. And my life is not over. There's more for me to do. And you give me the power, Jesus. And no, it's not easy, but it is necessary. God is not done with you. Come on, altar workers, find somebody. And let's pray and ask God to energize them with more strength, with the Holy Ghost. More Holy Spirit power in them this morning. More Holy Spirit power this morning. You can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Come on, find somebody. Find somebody, altar worker. Let's pray. Minister, let's pray for this morning.